afternoon everyone hope we're all well welcome to another find my past fridays live if you don't know my name is liam i'm in the customer service team here at find my past and also one of the hosts of fridays live so you've got me today you've got ellie in the comments as well so be sure to say hello to ellie as well let us know where you're coming in from how the weather is what have you got planned this weekend what we've been up to this week what's been going on let us know we can see a few people joining already so good to see some people back we've got linda coming in lynn from bc which i know now is british columbia so nice to see everyone we've got Roz from mass i'm gonna guess massachusetts not entirely sure and we're over oh, fairly crossing the pond today that's Ellen coming in from Roscoe, Illinois as well. So all corners covered here. Who else have we got? We've got Sue from Guildford in Surrey. Karen saying a warm and sunny London. Good to see. We're in Dundee. I'm in Dundee anyway. Ellen's in Edinburgh. I'm not sure what Edinburgh's like, but Dundee is very sunny at the moment, actually. I thought the grey clouds were coming out for a second, which is typical. As soon as I go live, the room goes dark. The clouds come out but we are, we've survived anyway, we have survived. We've got Anne coming in from across the water. She is in Fife, not across the water, is in America, across the water is in the River Tay, which separates me and Anne across there. I hey, hope you're enjoying the sun as well over there. We have got Ian coming in from Sunny Ruthin, North Wales. I'm sure Ellie will appreciate that. And who else have we got? We've got Sharon from Walls End, Tyne and Weir. I was actually in Newcastle last week, so I've round about that sort of area. So it was very nice down there, actually. It's my first time ever being in Newcastle, so a very nice city, actually. Very much enjoying my time there. Uh, Ellie saying she's making herself an iced coffee. We had a wee catch-up before we came on, and she was making me very jealous with this iced coffee she was making, this lovely syrup as well. So I'm just on the water in my classic Find My Past mug, so I was very jealous to see her with her iced coffee there, especially on a day like this. We have got Sally from Lovely Day in Whitney near Oxford. I'm glad to get her work today. She's been helping with GCSEs today at that time of year, I suppose, isn't it? Coming up to the, the end of term. And there, Matthew coming in. Saying you're a bit late, but you've made it on time. Only three minutes, Matthew. There's no danger there. You've made it in plenty of time. So good to see a few familiar faces in the comments there and saying she's got a chai tea very nice not a chai tea for a while something i need to get back into so no good to see so many familiar faces coming back we've got a few more minutes get a few people joining hey, whilst we are doing so i'll pop up the question of the week so you can start getting your answers in and we can start pulling some answers in to come back to later in the show so i'll pop it on screen there so when i'm doing the question of the week i like looking up like international days and national days to try and tie it into. Hey, you remember I did, I asked if you had artistic ancestors, that's because it was World Art Day. So I was having a look at the calendar today, but the days are all quite naff. Hey, my options were National Ballpoint Pen Day and National Ice Tea Day. So not Ice Coffee Day, sorry, Ellie, but Ice Tea Day it is today. Two quite hard ones to tie into family history, but it got me thinking, do you think any of your ancestors would deserve their own day of recognition and is there anything you do to commemorate them or any of your other ancestors any traditions you've kept on going through the years any way you honor any anniversaries of births or marriages deaths anything like that anything you commemorate your ancestors let us know as say traditions any remarkable ancestors that should have their own national day of recognition anything like that start getting your comments in and we'll come back to them later on in the show i'll get that off screen for now it's in the description of the video as well so if you need a reminder at all it will be down there for you as well sounds like Anne's getting a head start she's already been onto the newspaper archive so i think you might know what is to come in this session there and we've got a few more people joining as well we've got sally there karen's in her son's doing the a levels if you have to say that time of year as well Got Matt coming in from a hot and sunny East Yorkshire. Just got home from work. Nice sweet early finish on a Friday. Not too bad. You can take that. Making a coffee as well. So good stuff. So yeah, as I say, 
always good to see so many people coming back in, some familiar faces as well. Good stuff. So, ah, here's a national day I can get behind. National Gin Day on Sunday. So I can get behind that one. Not an appropriate one for Facebook Live. I don't know how that would go after a few gins, but Sunday, I'll be right there with you, Karen. A few goblets, few gins, some nice elderflower tonics. Exactly what you want on a, sun, a Sunday. Hopefully the weather keeps up for us as well. Nothing like a gin on a day like this. So definitely a good one to be celebrating. Better than National Ballpoint Pen Day anyway, put it that way. A bit more, bit more entertaining for us all. So let's see, Matthew's saying the pollen count is high as well. So something I suffer from myself as well there, Matthews. One downside of summer is that you get the good with the bad. You get the nice weather, but you've also got the hay fever that comes with it as well. So hopefully you're staying safe from that as well. So I feel like I might have started something here with the gin comment. We're all going to be in the pub after this session. Sally saying rhubarb and ginger gin with ginger ale. That sounds, ginger ale is one I'm not too big a fan of, but if there's gin involved, I might have to, to give it a go. So good stuff. So, hate the heat. <laughs> so good stuff. So I think we will start having a look at some new records. That is why we're here after all. So we'll start off with that. And I've just realized I'm halfway through the slideshow before I've even added it to the stream. So we'll pull that back and then we'll add it to the stream and you can see there. Good stuff. So yeah, new records, as I say, as I mentioned, and I mentioned newspaper archives earlier on. So that is something that we are gonna be talking about quite heavily today. As I say, it is quite a newspaper heavy day this week. So it'll be good to get into that. So new records, what have we got? We've got three new records online. There's three new record sets online, I should say, not three new records, much more than three new records. Three new record sets online, and they all stem from England newspaper notices. So we have England newspaper birth notices, marriage notices, and death notices as well. So you may remember last month, month before maybe, I did a little tutorial on how to search for specific types of articles in newspapers. And one of them was family notices, which is always a great source of information, adds a nice little bit extra to your usual birth, marriage, death indexes. Even when you get a birth certificate, marriage certificate, there can be some nice little detail in the papers as they just adds that something a little bit extra. So there's heaps of these records to get into. There are over 200,000 birth notices, close to 700,000 marriage notices, and over 1.8 million death notices as well. So as I say, plenty to get into there. And as I said, we did do a tutorial on how to search them in the newspaper periodical search page, but you don't need to do that anymore. There is their own record sets makes them a bit easier to search. And something I get asked a lot in customer service is how to add a newspaper record to your tree, which is not always straightforward to do. There's no sort of direct way of doing that. But with these records, it makes it nice and easy to do that as well. So we'll start looking at a few examples and see exactly what we have here. So starting with the birth notices. So I'm not, as I said before, I'm sure it's not just me that does this, but when a new record set comes out, you're going to search your own surname in there to see what's coming up, even if it's not anyone related. It's always worth a look. You get some good examples. And there, this is an example of some of the birth notices. This is from the Hull Daily Mail on 15th of September, 1944. A few of the examples of pool just happen to be from the Hull Daily Mail. I'm not playing favorites. It's just the results that came up when I was looking the best examples. So as I said about the extra sort of color that it adds to your usual birth, marriage, death indexes or the certificates as well, you can see if you look at the Boyle example in the middle there, it says that on September 14th at 11 Harley Street to Laurie, RAF, and Patty, Nee Turner, a sister for Patricia, both well. So straight off the bat there, you've got the birth date, you've got an address, a father's occupation, a mother's maiden name, and sibling's name as well. And a nice little comment at the end, both well, um, soon indicating that both mother and child are both doing well. So as the nice little comments, as well as the crucial information that you'd be looking for from these types of records. And as well as the 
Bur oh, sorry, as well as the burst, getting ahead of myself here. Sorry, I mentioned about how, how these are much more searchable now, much easier to search. But one thing I did notice when searching the birth records there, and even on the example there, you can see that very few, if any of them, have an actual child's name on the record itself. So when you are doing your searches, you might see the results coming up like this with no first name indexed. So if you are searching for the information and it's a known person you're searching for, I would recommend including the last name, the birth year, you could try the father's first name, eh, or if you know where the birth itself actually took place, then there's a good chance it's going to be reported in a local newspaper. So I would include that information as well and start seeing what is coming up in there as well. Now, moving on to the marriage records. So the marriage records, much like the birth records, have some really great and rich information in there as well. So much more extra than you would get from the indexes. And one thing I noticed when I was searching through these for a few examples was that one at the bottom, the April 10th one. So the newspaper is the Hereford Journal. But if you look at the bottom one, it's actually a marriage which seems to have taken place in India, in Dindi, in the Gunter district. Google did have to help me with the locale of that, but I've nailed it nonetheless. And so you can see the information there, so you know where the marriage was, took place at the Huddleston Stokes Esquire residence. You've got his occupation as well. And the marriage concerns an Arthur Loftus Steele, who is a lieutenant in the 6th Regiment Madras Native Infantry, Assist Assistant Civil Engineer First Division. So you've got not only an occupation, you've got regiments and divisions as well. You've got his father's name, Colonel Steele of the Madras Army, and he married Mary, the third daughter of William Huddleston, formerly of the Madras Civil Service. So not only are you getting information about the couple or the person who was born, married, or passed away, you're getting information about their families as well, what their parents did, even the fact that Mary was the third daughter. So if this is the first time you're coming across Mary marrying into your family, for example, you know straight off the bat that she has at least two other siblings as well. So if you're looking for them, make sure you're recording that sort of information too. So you can come back to that when you are building out that side of the family. Now, as well as new marriages, there are also married wedding anniversaries as well, which is a really nice little thing as you can find that a few years down the line from a, a marriage that you found in the papers already. A, one example that I really liked here was the Hudson Kustance a, example. There's two entries here. So the first one says, congratulations, Joan and Sid on your first wedding anniversary, January 15th, mother and dad. Whose mother and dad? We're not sure, but someone's parents has been nice enough to put a, a wedding anniversary message in the paper for them. And if you look down, you can see the second one says, congratulations, Joan Darlin on her first anniversary, January 15th, fondest love, Sid, by cable. So that would sort of indicate that I'm assuming it's been telegrammed in, it would be at that time, I'm guessing. So obviously 1943, every chance that Sid was fighting overseas at the time, he's maybe telegrammed in uh, a wedding anniversary note to his wife, Joan. It is one I did actually want to have a further dig into was Joan and Sid, just to get a little bit more about what was actually going on here, but I didn't have time to do so. So if you do find yourself at a loose end over the weekend and you fancy doing some research into something different, I'd appreciate if it's Joan and Sid and you can make sure to tell me more about that the next time that we come up. Moving on then to the death notices. And again, as I say, definitely not playing favourites, but the whole Daily Mail had all the best ones. So I've had no choice but to pull another one from them. And obviously this is one from 1941. So again, would have been during the war. And this one actually had in the birth, marriage and death uh, announcements had its own dedicated column to those who had been killed on active service, which is something that you can find in the records but you don't get the lovely little messages that you see on screen here. Can be quite emotional. I think Anne mentioned there that it is an emotional thing sometimes, especially when you're getting messages like this as well. Uh, I won't read it all in case I start getting choked up or I'll blame it on the hay fever if I do nonetheless. But uh, a little snippet there is from his mum, dad and brother Cyril. Our life's to us not the same. What we do to hear your voice and have you back again. 
So really lovely little messages that are in the papers there from family. And you've got another one down the line from his wife as well. They both popped it in the, the same one. And much like the wedding anniversaries, there are also death anniversaries as well in this in memoriam column as well. You've got one who is the same Charles Herbert Bryan that I showed the two examples for before. And again, you do have information like the brother's name, for example, a, his, his date of death and things like that. But the, real, the really hard hitting thing about it is the message from the family. Really quite emotional stuff to see even with no connection to this man. It's quite an emotional read. So you can imagine how that would hit if it's if it's one of your ancestors. So like I say, it might not always be the happiest thing to be reading, but as I say, just really lovely stuff. And yeah, as I say, very emotional stuff to be reading in the newspapers as well. So be sure to have a look in there as well. There are links from the blog post on the new record set as always. You can jump straight into the searching of them. And we haven't stopped at those three record sets. We have, of course, added new newspapers as well. We've pulled them up here. So only one new title. So the Sutton Coldfield Observer is looking quite lonely on the left-hand side there. But there are a heap of new updated titles on the right-hand side to get your teeth into. I think it was about 100,000 new pages overall being added to the archive this week. So as well as your birth, marriage and death announcements in the previous three record sets, a load of new titles, new pages to start searching, covering all over the, all over the country too. We've got Birmingham, we've got the Darlington North Star, Paisley Daily Express, Port Talbot Guardian, West Lothian Courier. So as I say, up and down the country, really good newspapers to get into as always. And if you are having a look through the newspapers, be it the announcements, or the updated and new titles, do be sure to let us know what you are finding in them as well. Always good stuff. So let's have, so we'll close that off and we'll have a little look through the comments. As I was saying that they're really sad. It is quite sad as I say, it's a, it was quite an emotional experience having to look through for all these examples. I tried to pull I wasn't trying to upset anyone on a Friday afternoon, but trust me, as I say, I went through it myself when I was looking through these examples. It was quite a laborious task going through all them, reading all these sort of lovely messages that families were reading, hey, families were leaving for be it a marriage, an anniversary, a death or a death anniversary. Hey, some really, really nice stuff in there. So definitely, as I say, have a look through them as well. Even if you've had a look through the uh, announcements, family notices section of the newspaper search page before might be worth having another look now as I say it's much easier to search it was a really good experience I had in searching these records and pulling these examples so definitely be be having another look through them and see there Kim's got a good example here so newspapers are fantastic recently discovered that my great grandfather's aunt was a kleptomaniac I'm going to sound after but kleptomaniac is that stealing I did, is it stealing things? I can't quite remember now. As I say, might look daft here. I can see Ellie's giving me a nod. Thank you. Definitely stealing. So, like I say, you never know what you're going to find in the newspapers, whether it's a family announcement, whether it's your great grandfather's aunt being addicted to stealing things. You never know what is lurking in the newspapers. So, definitely be having a look through them. I can see we do have some question of the week answers coming in. So we'll do a few of them before we get going, but keep putting them in. It's not too late. Keep getting them in. We'll come back. We've got time later on in the session as well, and we can start getting through more of them. But we'll have a look at what we have so far. So let's see what have we got. So we'll start off with Matthew here. I think Ellie has asked for more detail on this, so we'll maybe get a wee follow-up from Matthew later down the line. Hey, so Matthew found that his great-great-grandfather William and his first wife Harriet in the Redden Observer, 1884, causing a disturbance and the question and reading is quite interesting, both real characters. That's something, as I say, newspapers and both real characters as well. As I say, Ellie was right to ask for more details there, Matthew. You're definitely going to have to follow up on that one. You can't leave us hanging like that. So what have we got there? We've got Martin as well, a nice one here. So Matthew, his great-grandfather, born 1868, died in 1944, 17 years before. He was a twinkle in his mum's eye. Found that his grandfather was a master baker like both his parents. A 
apart from several successful businesses in Hastings and Kingston upon Thames. He found in Hastings and St. Leonard's Observer that he made a wedding cake for Mary, the Princess Royal, for her marriage to buy countless cells. Uh, I would not have known that without said local newspaper. So that's a really nice, as I say, ancestor that has really gone out and done something. Not just your regular baker, not just doing the cakes and the sausage rolls and Greg's, doing wedding cakes for Mary and the Princess Royal. So something really special there. And scroll back through. I do apologize for the awkward silences as I am frantically scrolling through comments. We have got Sue. She links her three times great-great-grandfather, Charles Thompson. He was a minister in Wick in Scotland, and he left the established church and held services for the free church in a local park before having a small church built. He went on to build a much bigger church, which closed in 2006 and is now a carpet shop. So I guess it's nice that the building's still there. At least they haven't knocked it down and thrown up modern apartments or anything like that. At least they're still somewhere that you can go to, to have that service. And a really nice thing as well, leaving the established church and just doing them in the local park as well. Nice intimate services, I imagine. So really cool. And easily my cousin, Dr. Mary Lee Edward, fascinating lady. She was the first woman to graduate from the University of Toronto as a doctor, so a real pioneer there, and was part of the US, US women's suffrage movement and was one of the women who went to France during World War I. Mary was said to have worked for 60 hours in surgery during constant bombardment. After the war, she, two other female doctors and a female nurse were in order, I'm struggling to get my words out today, maybe I have had a gin, were awarded a Croix de Guerre for their service, incredible lady. So I would say Dr. Mary Lee Edward definitely deserves her own national day, I think. So maybe we'll start having a record of these. We'll, we'll have our own calendar that I can operate on in future. We can ignore the ballpoint pen and iced tea, all that business. And we'll go for one more for now, but as I say, keep getting them in. A Kim has a fourth cousin who has a day named after us. So we've already got a national day named after someone in Alaska. Susan Butcher, two times champion of the Iditarod Trail. Uh, if I had to choose an ancestor, it would be my name changing great grandfather, celebrated on his birthday, 11th of April, and will be called Frustrating Ancestors Day. So I think a few people are going to hang off the coattails of that one, Kim. We've all got a few frustrating ancestors in there, so we can sympathize with you. But I'd love to hear more about Susan and what the what this trail is. I'm not going to attempt the pronunciation again, but if you can tell us more about what that trail is and what that would have entailed, then definitely do that in the comments and we can come back to that one when we're doing a, a few more further down the line. We've got a few more answers coming in. So yeah, as I say, keep getting your answers in and we'll come back to them shortly. I'll be set before we get in. So the next segment I'm going to do, I'm fully aware that I'm going to be talking for a little while. You'll probably get sick of the sound of my voice. So before we jump into that, I will try and get you lot involved in something. We're going to play something of a little game. So I'll add this to the stream just now. So hopefully you can see on screen what is Wordle. Now, if some of you aren't aware what Wordle is, it is a word-based game that is New York Times that run it, or the New York Post, New York Times it is that run it. And basically the aim of the game is to guess a five-letter word. So it's a set five-letter word every day. Everyone guessing the same word. And you have to guess what the word is in six or less guesses. What I've done is a genealogy-themed wordle. So we can have a go at this together. No prizes, community effort. Good stuff. So in case, as I say, I'm quite addicted to Wordle. It's the first thing I do every morning when I wake up. But if some of you have more of a life, aren't as sad as me, I'll do a quick run through and show you just how exactly how Wordle actually works with this example. So you start off with any five letter word of your choosing. I have a set word that I use every morning and that is arise. So you put in arise, and then this is what comes up. So the A in yellow means that there is an A in the word, but it's not in the right place. And the E in green means that the E is in the right place. So if I've guessed arise and that's what comes up, then I might want to have another little guess at what the word might be. We'll say glaze, for example. Now we know L, A and E are in the right place. So 
what else could we possibly guess there? What could the word be? I wonder. I'll have a stab at place. And ta-da, I've got the word in three guesses. That is nothing like how my morning word or routine goes. I'm usually there for about half an hour pulling my hair out, five, ten minutes in between guesses. I actually set the word place so I knew what it was, and it still took me three guesses. So but we'll have a go at, uh, as I say, genealogy themed one. The hardest bit of this for me was thinking of five letter genealogy words. Thankfully, Ellie listed off about 20 within a few minutes. So many thanks to Ellie for her help. So we'll do we'll do a mob rule version, I think. We'll try and get some guesses in from if everyone wants to start popping guesses in and we'll start picking what seems to be the the most common word. So what we're looking for here is a five letter word related to genealogy. So if anyone wants to start us off with a five letter word, we've got one coming in already. So Matt, is everyone happy with Matt? Yep, we're getting a few guesses in there. So we've got two votes for birth so far, one for death. Oh, death seems to be winning. Apologies, Matt, you've been, I think you've been overruled here. We're going to, as I say, it's mob rule today. So we're going to take the most popular guess. So we'll start off with death. So we know there is an A in the word but there is not a D, E, or a T, H. So that will rule out the birth option that we were saying. So we know there's an A in the word. So what's another genealogy word that contains an A? Five letters. As I say, I'm, I, if, if I was on the other end, if I was in Ellie's position today and she was doing this and I was doing the comments, I'd be no help whatsoever, but I don't even think Ellie knows what the word is actually. So she doesn't know, does she? Uh -huh. Maybe I'll need to private message her. Karen's gone for place. So we'll give, give place a go unless anyone has got any other options. Diane saying marry, adopt, grave. We won't do place actually, because that would be the A in the same place. So we'll, we'll skip that one. We don't want to, Sacrifice again. So that's two guesses for adopt now. So we'll give adopt a go. But we are no closer. We know the A isn't in there. I did see an option for Mary from Diane. So we'll go with Mary. Oh, so now we know the A is in the right place. So we're looking for a five letter genealogy word second letter being A. I'm just gonna ping Ellie what the word actually is. So George, Ellie doesn't want to know actually, Ellie wants, oh, I thought I was, I was trying to be nice to you there. I thought I would, I would tell Ellie the word and she would give you a clue, but Ellie doesn't even want a clue. So what else could we got? We've got A in there, so we don't know any other words. So it's quite a hard one now. As I say, I, I'd be here all evening if it was me. I'm even starting to think if I know what the word is. Ellie's put a guess in. How does everyone feel about Ellie's guess? Ellen's got a guess in there as well. I can see Ellie dancing away in the webcam. She's looking pretty confident. Getting a few guesses in for that. Now I'm really hoping that I've actually picked the right one and we are right. Da -da -da. Yay. Four guesses. Good stuff, as I say, a real community effort in there. Still had two guesses left to go. So, and to be fair, with one green letter, that is pretty good going, as I say. I'd have been there for another half hour getting this thesaurus and the dictionary out, trying to think of five letter words. So four guesses, that was fun, I hope. I hope everyone enjoyed that. If it was your first venture into Wordle, then get on board every morning as I say there's a new one every single day at midnight I'm not as sad enough that I wait I keep up till midnight waiting for the word but as I say it's the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning so good stuff a real community effort we got there in the end and look that's why I didn't tell Ellie the word because she knew it all along she knew what the word was secretly so that is Victoria's first word of she's saying so I get on to Victoria if you google wordle after here you can do it as I say it's a daily game it's Fun little thing, nice little brain teaser to get the day going in the morning as well. And 
sometimes you learn a new word as well as the case may be because I have no idea what some of the words mean sometimes but it's fun nonetheless so good stuff as I say if you would like to see any more genealogy themed wordles or if there's any other games that we could make a, a genealogy version of then do let us know we can have a, another little stab at that as well so yeah let us know Ellie's put a comment in there if we should play this again at some point so if you want to give that a thumbs up if you agree or pop in the comments if you'd like to see more as I say wordle or any other any other popular games we could do a genealogy of I've seen a few people now saying about cordal and octurdle but I'm so one track minded with five letter words now. I actually opened the six letter word one yesterday to give it a go and just hit a total blank. All my all the words I th I think I speak and type in five letter words exclusively now because I, all I can think of is arise and things like that. That's always my starting word. So I would struggle with anything more than five is is a bit beyond me. Good stuff. So as I say, the next segment is going to be me talking for quite a while. So hopefully that got his all involved, got the brains going before we get going. So if you've been with us before, you'll know that we usually do a few different segments to the show. We've got the new records, which we've done, and we'll do a record set you may have missed, and also like a little tutorial, little hints and tips section as well. Technically speaking, I haven't done a tutorial this week, not out of my own laziness. Instead, I have incorporated it into the record set that you may have missed. So I'll pop my slides on screen now. So the record set that I'm going to talk to you today about is the United States Naturalization Petitions. It's an American record set, hence why I've used the Z in naturalization. Please do not judge me. So this is the record set that I'm going to talk to you all about today. So first of all, before we look at the records themselves, a little bit of background as to what we are actually looking at here. So what is naturalization? So naturalization is the act of making someone a legal citizen of a country that they were not born in. So i.e. your ancestor migrates to America, might live there for a little while, and then eventually will become a fully fledged US citizen. So in 1906, the US government formed the Bureau of Immigration and Naturalization. And at that point in time, it was decided that more information was going to be required from those applying to be citizens. More information being required from the applicants is obviously good news for us as family historians, means there's even more detail on the records that we're looking at. Type of thing you can expect would be usual stuff, full name, date of birth, place of birth, there's a really nice relation section in which they list things like their spouse and their children, you'll get occupations, addresses, details of when and how they traveled to the United States, so really good information in there and as Ellie says there are photos as well, you will quite often find a photo of the person in the record set as well. This particular set covers four states, that is Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, and Pennsylvania, New York being one I'm going to show you. And if you are looking at the records, be sure to use the browse option. There's quite often a second page to the records. So make sure you're flicking to that next image in case there is any more information on the person that you are looking for. So as I said, technically not a tutorial, but incorporated a tutorial. And for this, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about one of my ancestors. So if it is not being glaringly obvious at this point after my fourth session, I'm not really an expert in family history. Uh, I would hand over to people like Ellie, Jen, even yourselves in the comments will know much more about this sort of stuff than me. So the first time I actually used these records was the very first time I did any sort of American research. And that was for a gentleman in my family tree by the name of Richard Downs. So at a certain point in time, this, what you see on screen is what I had on Richard. So I knew he was born in 1903 in Dublin. I had him on the 1911 census with his parents in Dublin. He popped up again on the 1922 Irish Army census in County Kerry. And it's in County Kerry where he married my great grand aunt Maria. That is my grandfather's aunt. And that's in 1924 that that took place, hence why he's on the family tree. And I knew they had two children in Dublin, 
born one born in 1925 and one 1926 and that's all i had at a certain point of time i hadn't gone down his line any further or him and maria any further so one day i was doing a long overdue review of my outstanding hints on my family tree and one of the ones i came across was a tree hint for richard so if you have your family tree on Find My Past, you may have seen a hint appearing from another user's family tree where you have an ancestor in, co in common and you can see the information that the other person has for them as well. And the other person had much and such the same as what you see on the screen, but they had Richard's death and they had him dying in New York, which I thought wasn't necessarily out of the ordinary. They're uh, an Irish family in the earliest 20th century. Every chance they might have migrated to America, but as I say, it's not something I had researched just yet. But instead of just accepting the, the, the tree hint and they were the family that went to America, adding all that to the tree, I obviously went to do my own research on this. And the first place I started was the travel and migration records, mainly the passenger lists. And in searching the passenger lists, I found this entry for Richard Downs. Note that the E in his surname is missing, uh, which is, it was the correct spelling I showed you before with the E, but on the passenger list there was no E, so it was a bit tricky to I track down in the end. But when I found him, he had the address of 11 Emerald Street, which I had seen on other records. So I knew it was him, and at this point I knew he departed Liverpool on 4th of December, 1926 on the SS Megantic and he traveled alone which again not necessarily out of the ordinary quite common that the head of the house would go to the new country first they would set up get a job start saving money and eventually get the rest of the family over so the next step was to find Maria and the children in the travel and migration passenger list which I found Maria and the two kids traveling on the 18th of August, 1927 on the RMS Adriatic. So as I say, he went in December 26, they were over in August 27, which might not seem like that long a time in the grand scheme of things, only eight, nine months, but you can imagine the strain that we'd have had on both sides of the family. Richard's in a new country himself, getting a job, saving up money, trying to get his family over and the children were only two and younger at the time. So Maria is stuck in Dublin with two, a newborn and a toddler. So fun times for her, I'm sure. I'm sure she enjoyed that. But they eventually did come over and they were reunited in the States in 1927. So the next place I went was the US census of 1930, where I found the family there. And this is the second spelling of Downs that I encountered. In 1930, they've been put down as Dons, essentially, an A instead of an O in the surname. But that was the family all, all listed there. And if you've never used the US censuses before, which, as I say, I hadn't at this point, there are heaps of different columns in there with some really detailed information. And one that I noticed was the citizenship column. And if you look in the middle, number 23, naturalization, he has AL, or all the family, I should say, have AL in the naturalization column. Now, does anyone know what AL stands for or like to have a guess at what it might stand for in the context of citizenship and, as I say, Irish immigrants to the US? If anyone knows what AL in the citizenship column might stand for, as I say, I think, can't remember if I googled it or if I asked Jen in the end, but I didn't know off the top of my head, but yeah, a few people getting it, alien that would be. So that's like the official term that they use in the US to describe an, an immigrant to the country who is not a citizen, an alien. Another five letter word Victoria says, that would have been a good one actually for Wordle, alien, I'll keep that in mind. So yeah, they were all still classed as aliens in the 1930 census, even though they'd been there for three, four years at that point. So at this point, I went to have a look uh, what else was out there in terms of US records? I'd never used them before. I knew there was obviously censuses, birth, marriage, deaths, etc. But I didn't really know what else was out there. And it was at this point that I stumbled upon the United States naturalization petitions. So these are the forms of people applying to be US citizens. 
So straight off the bat, when I found a search page, I thought there must be some good information in there. If I'm given as many search options as that, father's name, spouse name, mother's name, there's even a few more options that have been cut off my screenshot there. I thought there must be something good in there. So I popped in Richard's name and there was only 10 results, which was quite manageable. So I just had a look first and last name only and started having a look at the records. And one of the ones that I found was this form here. So unfortunately, whoever was doing the typing of this official form wasn't very good at staying in the lines, makes some of the information quite difficult to see, but straight away you can see the sheer depth of information that is included in here. You've got the things I mentioned, name, address, occupation. You've also got a description of the person as well. So you've got gender, race, complexion, hair color, eye color, even height and weight as well, which you can imagine. You can start building up a picture of the person in your head with that sort of information. But as Ellie said, there are quite often photographs in this record set. And I was very lucky to see that this was one which had a photograph. So if we go to the next page, we can see that is the bottom half of the form. And that is Richard Downs on the left-hand side, full photograph with his signature underneath, which photographs are all, well, signatures are always really cool to see, but you can get them on some records, like some censuses, for example, will have a signature of the head of the household. But to see photograph and name signature right underneath it was really, really cool. And as I say, something really special, especially because this is a guy who married into my family. So he would have been in America before any of my living relatives were born. So I don't think I'd have had any photos of him otherwise if it wasn't for this record set. So it was really nice to be able to see that and not just have to picture a guy with fair complexion and brown hair and blue eyes, but to actually see the guy himself in the photograph. So that was in 1936 that he became uh, a naturalized citizen of the, U of the US. So when I went to, I've jumped ahead of myself again, sorry, that's just a clearer version of the form. This person much better at staying in the lines, much clearer information. You can see the names and everything like that printed out much clearer. So then when I went to the 1940 census, uh, I noticed that in the citizenship column, Richard had N-A, in the naturalization column. Confusingly enough, does not mean non-applicable. It actually means naturalized. So him, Thomas and Ellen, the two kids are all NA, but you can see that Maria is still AL. She's still classed as an alien at this point in time, although the rest of the family, I believe the children would have been automatic as a result of their father's application, but the mother, Maria, would have had to do her own application. So back to the drawing board on Maria, and I was able to find a much similar form for Maria as well. You can see much and such the same information that is on the form there. You've got her height, her weight, not sure how comfortable she'd have been given that information out, but it's there nonetheless for us to see. No picture of Maria, unfortunately, but as I say, still some really good information on there and you can start building a picture of the person on there as well. So that's Maria. Now we mentioned at the start of the uh, presentation that to check the following pages in case there are any more information on there that might help you. And on the back of this particular page was the affidavit of witnesses. So these are the two people who bore witness to Maria's application. So I know Jen's just been mentioned in the comments there. I would be amiss if I did not mention fan research at this point. Was it, I'm put myself in the spot here, friends, associates, neighbors. So that fan research. So if you are looking for someone overseas like this family in America, if I was to go down the line of Ellen Stewart and Eleanor Meehan, that would start building up a picture of the company they kept in this new country, the social circles they were moving in, and yeah, the types of people that they were, they'd settled with really. And because they say they've known Maria since 1933, uh, this form is 1941. So they've obviously known the family for at least eight years at this point. So must have been quite close associates, especially to be named as witnesses on her form. So let's say that was 1941. And if I can jump ahead to the quite recently released, actually, 1950 US census, which was my first kind of 
venture into that as well, which I only actually did in leading up to this presentation. The column I've highlighted on the right hand side that says yes, that confirms that now Richard and Maria and the children underneath who have been cut off of the screenshot, but both of them are now US citizens, naturalized citizens of the United States and can reap the benefits of whatever may come with being so back in the 1940s, 1950s. And the family actually stayed for the rest of their days in America as well. Uh, both would stay there. They ended up having children in the United States as well. They had another daughter in America. They've still got grandchildren living in America as well. And funnily enough, through a treaty tree hint, I'm actually in contact with one of their kids as well. So she's still in America. That's my granddad's cousin. And neither of them actually knew each other existed when I told both a Richard's daughter and my grandfather, neither of them knew each other existed even. So it was a really nice thing to be able to not only tell the story of Richard and Maria's trip to the United States and their subsequent life there, but to have that sort of personal connection and be able to tell people about people that they didn't know, whereas they're actually first cousins. So a really nice little thing. So if I can wrap that up with just some top tips, Liam's top tips for overseas success, the things that I would have found useful when I was doing my research here. So the first thing to mention is that when you do have a tree to do hint, always do your own research. This ended up being correct because funnily enough, it was Richard's daughter. So who was I to second guess what she knew about her own father? But as I say, always do your own research. Make sure you're backing that up with the records. And when it comes to searching both the travel records and the overseas records, make sure you are being creative with the options. Use your wild cards, use your name variants. As we saw, three different spellings of downs, including the correct one. So using wild cards, using name variants can be a really good way of, of narrowing the search down if you are having trouble. And if the ancestor did go to the United States, make sure you're checking for a naturalization record. I think it's a really good, almost like a companion to the travel and migration records as well. Some really nice extra details in there as we saw. Photographs as well, it's a big thing people are always looking for. So definitely worth a look. And as we saw, we can use the censuses as a guide to check if and when they are naturalized in the United States. And last of all, as I say, keeping Jen happy, do some fan research about their lives abroad. Make sure you're finding out more about as I say, the company they kept, the social circles they moved in, what sort of occupations their friends had, who were they staying next door to. Build a nice little picture about, as I say, their friends, the neighborhoods that they lived in as well. So yeah, as I say, that is a bundle of records that you might have missed and a nice little tutorial hopefully as well. So if you are were like me and had yet to venture into the United States research side of things, make sure you're looking at those naturalization records, especially if they went to those four states that I mentioned, uh, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York, and Connecticut. Those are the four covered by that uh, record set there. Uh, I can see we've got a few questions, people going back and forth. So I appreciate Linda taking the time to go to Wikipedia on my behalf, saves me a job. And yet, yeah, so the rules did change over time, different a different forms were required. It took different lengths of time as well. So as I say, dependent on the time period you're interested in, you might need to double check what's out there for the time. A, we've got one from Victoria, which I'll pick up there. What would be a refusal reason for naturalization? So I'm not sure about naturalization itself, but as I said, about being in contact with Richard's daughter, a, a story that she actually told me, which no one in my family that I spoke to knew, was that not long after Richard and Maria went to America, my, my great grandparents and my grandfather and his brother, they had actually tried to go to America as well to move to New York with Richard and Maria. But my great grandfather was a laborer and he had suffered a really bad injury and he, his leg, he was having real trouble with his leg and he said effectively he wasn't fit to work. In the 1939 register, it says that occupation unfit labourer and not fit for work. So because of that injury, apparently he was actually refused entry to the United States. He wasn't going to be fit to work, especially when you're talking about Irish people going over in the early 20th century. It would have been your shipyards, your labouring and jobs that they would have been due to go into. So he wasn't going to be fit for those work and apparently was told 
he is not needed at that point because of his injury. So I say that might be one of the reasons if you were not fit for work or you didn't have necessary skills that would contribute to the economy and things like that, then you might be refused naturalization. But I don't think there's any forms on here that would show a reason for refusal. I've yet to come across any, but as I say, that's the only real dip into those records I've done. So if anyone is having a look at those records and comes across any reasons for refusal, then do let us know as well and we can see what else. And if you've had any success with those records as well, then you can let us know in the comments too and see, oh, been a bit overzealous there. Good stuff. So yeah, hopefully, as I say, that was useful and interesting. A nice, nice little story time about my ancestor anyway. So I think we've got nine minutes left. So we will do a few more question of the week answers before we wrap up today. And I may have missed Matthew's follow-up comment. I'm not sure if it has come in yet, but if it has and I've missed it, uh, he does, he has it here. So we'll start off with Matthew's follow-up there. So it was quite a long article. So you can't give all the detail here. I was hoping you could pop the image in, but looks like I can't. Let's say there was a lot of swearing, fighting, etc. A PC Brown stated that at 10 minutes to 12 on Monday night, he heard a woman shouting in Friar Street. He went down the street and saw it was a female prisoner. He had heard her swearing at the male prisoner who ran after her and she shouted murder as loud as she could holler. Witnesses asked her what the matter was. And unfortunately, the comment's been cut off there. I can't see any more, so I'm not sure if we can... Ellie might be able to follow up with that one. Unfortunately, it's been cut off from my screen. I can't quite see the, the end if there is a, another bit to that. It ends with dot, dot, dot. So thank you very much, Matthew. As I say, good to get a follow-up from that as well. We've got a couple more, and then I will let you go and enjoy the weekend. Although, saying that, the skies have gone grey and it is heavens have opened here, so I'm not sure what of a weekend I'll be enjoying, but nonetheless we will get on. So we've got a few couple here from Ellen. So the four women of the Mayflower who survived the first that first winter, including her 10th great-grandmother, Eleanor Biggin Billington, sorry. They took care of the rest of the men and children by doing those womanly things, cooking, washing, cleaning, taking care of the sick. Strong doesn't begin to describe them. I think that's one thing. Like You often see the women on censuses and things like that, and their occupation will be like housewife or housekeeping duties, unpaid domestic duties. But like, so you don't always understand the circumstances that that was in. Like, for example, if her occupation on a census or anything like that was unpaid domestic duties, as the case may be, it doesn't give the full picture. You don't know what was going on and really the work that these women were putting in to, to keep these people, keep these people alive, basically, keep these people going. So a really good one, definitely one that deserves her own national day. And we've got one more here from Matt. So a family whisper past the years, always good to get a family whisper, that her great-grandfather's older brother died in a grain silo on the docks. No death certificate found. So I investigated over 10 years to find that he died in Ardrossan, although he is from Hull, and that he died trying to save five men who were overcome by carbon monoxide fumes whilst recovering bad wheat from a wrecked ship. He was honoured in the Carnegie Roll of Heroes and he receives recognition throughout the family and his photo is on the wall. So that's a really nice one to remember as well. Although a sad story in the end with him having died in that silo, tragic circumstances, but really, really putting his life on the line to help try and save these, these five men. And again, one that definitely deserves to be remembered, whether it's in the Carnegie Roll of Heroes or a family photo on the wall and a story that's passed down through the ages, especially when a whisper has been confirmed like that. We've all got stories that grandparents, great grandparents told us, but to confirm it with something like that is a really special thing as well. So thank you very much for sharing that, Matt. And thank you all very much for sharing your answers to the question of the week as well. Uh, another little dig through the comments before we go today. Got a few suggestions for games as well. We've got Boggle and Scrabble, things like that. So one for the drawing board. We can hey, have a look into that as well. A few more gin comments in. Remember, gin Sundays, everybody. Get your gins in. Nice excuse to get that on there. So, yeah, I think I will go and battle this rain and have a little Friday night run to the shops, pick up my bottle of gin perhaps. But thank you all very much again for your time and for being with us here today. 
Thank you, Ellie, for your support in the comments, as always. Hey, I hope you all have a really lovely weekend, whatever you are getting up to. Take care, and I will see you on the next one. Thank you very much, everyone.